Hello everybody, this is Justin, and today on Taming Top 1 Success Stories, we have John with us. Um, John has a very interesting story. If you're Type 1, especially if you're thinking of getting into aviation, you'll want to check this one out. This is a really cool story here. So, uh, John, go ahead and start us off. When did you get diagnosed with diabetes? Yeah, so I got uh, diagnosed uh, just over five years ago now, uh, so I was definitely late onset. Uh, I'm just uh, 40 years old now, so when I was 35 years old, got uh, got the diagnosis. So I uh, came to it later in life and then had to put myself on a pretty quick learning track. I uh, was always into health and nutrition and fitness before that. But, of course, this added a significant wrinkle uh, to my career that we'll get to here in just a bit. So you were, you were a health guy before this. Um, what were you eating before you were diagnosed with diabetes? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'd say I complied with a standard athlete's, I guess, protocol. I have a little bit of nutritional training from a minor that I did, uh, actually, when I was up in uh, Ohio State, just north of you. Um, and, you know, more carbohydrate, you know, laden, I guess, than uh, definitely we're both into now. But, uh, you know, I did a lot of endurance and then strength uh, activities as well. So, you know, I could kind of get away with it, but um, I was aware of things like, you know, trying to minimize processed foods and, um, you know, eat healthy, you know, cook as much as you could. But uh, at the time, I didn't really have the, I guess, need to dive further into the various fueling strategies. And as long as I felt good while I was exercising and didn't have a weight issue, I figured, you know, that was uh, working for me at the time. Okay, I understand. Yeah, that's general uh, consensus right there. Eat healthy carbs, exercise, you'll be fine. Sorry sure. that didn't work out so well for you. Uh, getting type 1 diabetes happens to the best of us. Um, did the doctor just give you the same kind of advice when you were diagnosed? Is the same thing you're already doing or did it tell you something different? No, it's uh, pretty uniform across the board, you know, when he went in. Uh, you know, shortly after they got everything stabilized in the uh, in the hospital there, um, you know, it literally was, uh, I was discharged, you know, with uh, a prescription for a, you know, Lantus Humalog and, you know, pick up a blood, a blood glucose monitor on the way home from the hospital. And then when I did go in to actually see an endocrinologist um, and more specifically the CDE, you know, their uh, kind of take on nutrition as a whole was not ideal. And, you know, kind of uh, the first couple of meetings that, uh, you know, that I had with the CDE, I was, you know, it was almost laughable, you know, where as much as I could learn in a short amount of time, you know, it just was very obvious that diabetes is a disease of basically extreme carbon tolerance. And here they are telling you to eat, you know, plenty of portions of carbohydrates and not too much protein because it'll damage your kidneys and this and that. And I was just like, where, where is this coming from? You know? So, right. Yeah. It, it was. It would have been comical if it wouldn't have been such disastrous information for those who, you know, haven't, I guess, taken or been able to uh, kind of go their own route and start doing some of their own research. So you, it seems like you were a little bit cognizant already that um, carbs were an issue, even though you're eating a healthy carb diet before then. Um, but I sure. want to backtrack a little bit. How did you first find out you were diabetic? Yeah, so that was kind of an interesting story. Um, given my current career or my current career and career at the time, uh, you know, obviously I needed to be able to see things at you know longer distances, airplanes, runways, that type of stuff, um, as a commercial airline pilot. So very uh, initial stages there, I started to have a little bit of blurred vision. And, you know, at first just kind of thought it was maybe a uh, change to my pres uh, prescription for my contacts or something of that nature. So I went into the uh, ophthalmologist and, you know, they gave me a stronger prescription and that seemed to help. But then it further deteriorated and I still couldn't see great at long distances. And that was the, you know, looking back, as I now know, you know, that was one of the signs because you know of course that's giving a lot of stress you know the high blood glucose values are putting a lot of stress on the you know very small capillaries in your eyes which is why it affects them so uh predominantly um and it's one of the first things that you notice um so that was probably the very first sign but you know i didn't really notice it at the time but probably the thing that really drove me into the hospital 
was just extreme weight loss. You know, I probably stood at about, you know, 6'2 and 175 pounds right now. And when I finally made my way into the hospital, I was, you know, just, just north of 150. So I think I was at 152. So almost a 25 pound weight loss, you know, was, was definitely what kind of drove me in there and extreme fatigue. And of course, some of the other stuff like, you know, having to pee all the time and, you know, all that was, was incorporated towards the end as well. All right, so you go to the doctor, you get diagnosed with type 1, he gives you the typical standard advice, and you're thinking, huh, wait a minute, if I'm supposed, to, if I'm trying to not have high blood sugar, I should start avoiding carbs. Um, did you did you think that and switch to a low-carb diet then and there, or how'd that go exactly? Yeah, so it was um, kind of a uh, process of, trial and error on my part where, you know, once I had um, a blood glucose monitor, but also what really kind of put me over the edge to really see what various foods did was uh, when I initially started using the Dexcom G4 and had a continuous glucose monitor, and you could really see, you know, or fill in the gaps, you know, you can see those rises and in, in, in subsequent, you know, lower blood sugars after meals. And so what I started to do was just say, well, you know, if I ate some eggs and then I had uh, maybe a gluten-free waffle and then, you know, something else with it. And I said, well, what happens if I just take out that waffle? Oh, look at that. You know, like I don't have as high of a spike and I only need half a unit to deal with it, you know, the, the same meal. And so I just gradually started to come to that conclusion and then started to work the carbohydrates and so on out of various meals and find various uh, replacements for those and just saw a massive um, improvement in blood glucose management from that, from a uh, time and range standpoint, and just the amount of, I guess, mental work, I guess, that it takes throughout the day combined with, you know, just, I was already insulin sensitive because of, you know, my uh, activities, but uh, I mean, it, it was just a matter of uh, finding that, as a side or rather on my own and then uh, going and finding more research to kind of back it up and that's where i you know gradually stumbled into uh you know dr bernstein's work and then also um a couple other low carbohydrate um, podcasts and, and that type of stuff as i just started to research things i see so it wasn't even you finding dr b and then making the switch you sort of figured out on your own through experimenting through uh, seeing what raised your blood sugar, what does it, and just making the switch slowly but surely. Then you found Dr. Bernstein. Then you found all these other low carb people in the on online and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, going back to Dr. Bernstein, you know, his book was just giving a lot of clarity to things that I had noticed on my own, and also giving it a lot of uh, or you know, validating it to say, well, this is, you know, someone who's gone through medical school, who is also a type one, who is also, you know, very uh, far along in, in, in their career and their life and is having success with it. So therefore, you know, I'm kind of one of those people that, uh, you know, someone can say something, but if they actually walk the walk and have the, the results, that speaks probably the, that, that speaks the loudest as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. I mean, just the fact that Bernstein is as old as he is and still healthy is like a unicorn for type one. And just seeing that is just seeing that kind of example really um, is convincing to me. And it, it, it works as a good example. But um, back to you, back to how you're doing. How long did it take for you exactly to go from the high car approach that you were recommended to the low car approach where you're at now? Like what, how long was that time span? Um, I would say it was six months, maybe. About six you know, months. As I just kind of gradually started titrating that back. And as a comparison, you know, my HbA1c when I was diagnosed was 13.2. And by my six month HbA1c, so two, you know, basically two uh, lab results later, you know, it was below 6.2. And then after that six months, I've been uh, between 5.6 and 5.2 for the last four and a half years. That's fantastic. So, you know, and it, it's just one of those things where once I found something that was working, 
you know, um, I, you know, you just, yeah, I mean, there's certain foods here and there that, you know, there's a little bit of trial and error with, but, um, also just doing more research on the advantages for everyone's health as far as, you know, significantly cutting down on their carbohydrate intakes and, uh, reducing, um, processed foods too, because there's a lot of very negative, uh, consequence from process, processed foods as a whole, not just carbohydrates, but, um, you know, there's just, yeah, it, the, the results spoke for themselves. So that was all the motivation I needed. Absolutely. So you notice some significantly pretty significant differences pretty early on. And six months in, you go from a lot less control, high 1C to 6.2, and then now you're really doing well with your blood sugar. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, the last one I had just the last month was 5.4 or so. And that's, you know, not just um, that control, but also, as you know, and as you spoke about in some of your videos, you know, that time and range. You know, I have my, uh, you know, Dexcom set between 75 and 120. And, you know, my time in range is generally somewhere around 90% up into the upper 90 percentile, you know, so there are some very gradual excursions there, but, you know, it's just like you bring those limits down as far as when you decide to correct, and then that's going to give you a better, a better uh, result. And unfortunately, there are some uh, folks that haven't had adequate um, education on how to use some of the tools that are available properly. And, you know, unfortunately, some people will, will use things like a, a tremendous tool or can be a tremendous tool, like a, a continuous glucose monitor, almost like a dump die alarm, you know, and you're really not getting everything you could out of it. You know, if you're using it, like setting your high at, you know, 300 and you're low at 60, just because you don't want it to irritate you all day. Yeah. yeah, the thing about time and range for me is that it can be such a good measure, but there's no standard for it. So you'll, right. you'll have doctors recommending patients to have a time range, uh, have a range of like 80 to 180 or 200 or 250. And sure. when you do that, it, it's almost a meaningless number because you can brag about your time range being a hundred percent. But if your range is between 70 and 250, that's not, not really a good thing. It's not a good measure. If, if, sure. if everyone's range was like yours and mine, which, for both of us, it's 70 to 120, which I think is pretty reasonable, just given the data, given the given the science behind how complications develop and what a healthy blood sugar is. I think yeah. it's pretty reasonable. If that was a standard, then time range would be an excellent number to go by, but unfortunately, it's abused, and often the doctors enable that abuse by telling patients that it's okay to have these kind of high blood sugars. I find it very unfortunate, but having it 70 to 120 and 9%, being in range is really good control. So congratulations for that, man. Yeah. Well, and, you know, on that note, what you're saying was there's no, uh, I guess, agreed upon time and range. Basically, what I did was I went and I uh, looked at data from non-diabetic athletes and, and folks that were, you know, adhering to a fairly, you know, healthy diet with minimally processed foods and, you know, some of them have been put on CGMs and have been studied clinically to find out what a normal non-diabetic uh, blood glucose value or ranges should be. Uh, none, of, none of them have been done on a low-carb diet per se, but um, they have done them on non-diabetic athletes. And with that, generally their range does fall right in that somewhere between 65 and you know uh, 120. Uh, and then with some postprandial or post-meal spikes into the 130s or 140s, but rapidly coming back down into that more normal range. And then, of course, also referencing some of the uh, the same studies that Dr. Bernstein utilized to come to his, you know, 83. On that note, I would say that occasionally folks, I think, um, you know, that you see on some of the various Facebook groups and so on, look at some of those numbers like a fasting blood glucose number and think that like that's where they need to stay all the time and they they feel like they're not doing a good job because they're not at you know 83 or 85 or what have you you know there's a caveat to that to say well if you just you know went out and you're in the middle of exercise it's completely natural for your body to have a 
response to that and metabolize and release or produce a certain level of blood glucose to sustain the activity and then come back down after the activity is done. You know, like some of my friends that uh, I race with and I do a lot of mountain bike racing and that type of stuff, you know, with, when they're out exercising hard, their blood glucose is in the 120s and 130s. So it's not natural for you to force your blood sugar to be at 80 when you're out running. You know, it's, it's natural to have a slightly higher blood glucose value during exercise, but the key is you want it to come back down in range relatively quickly. So there's some caveats to that type of stuff as well. Absolutely. I agree 100% with that. Um, people, people, especially in the low-carb type 1 community, we get, a lot of us become perfectionists about it, and we feel bad if our blood sugar gets a little too high or a little too low. But it's something to understand that even healthy people, like you're saying, even healthy people don't have a flat line 83 all the time. Unless you're eating like a pure carnivore approach and you're as, sens you're as insulin sensitive as all get out and you never exercise, maybe then. But you don't have to strive for that. Healthy people sure. that live for you know up to 100 have blood sugar that can sometimes be too high or too low. But that's okay as long as you're bringing it back to normal. As long as you're staying in a range for a good amount of time, you're going to be okay. And you're going to be especially better than 99% of other type 1 diabetics, nonetheless. So, sure. yeah, be happy with that. Be happy with those numbers. It's not always going to be perfect, but as long as you have, as long as you're doing pretty good most of the time, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And, yep. yeah, especially with exercise, because that, that can always be tough to manage. I always get questions all the time about exercise, actually, about how to manage it with type 1 diabetes. So, as uh, someone who's athletic, tell me, how do you manage to have a good blood sugar reading with exercise? How do you manage to not go too low and not go too high and so on? Yeah, I think there's a, a few um, components to that, you know, just um, being comfortable with your particular insulin regime, whether that be through a pump or MDI. I, I do MDI myself. I always have. I don't really have any plans on going over to a pump. Um, but if you are using a pump, being confident with how your insulin treatment or your insulin regime and your type of insulin responds to your body, um, you know, that's a really key component for, you know, good uh, management anyway, but it becomes even more uh, important when you're out exercising because you're kind of uh, getting your body out of the normal equilibrium that it would be in when you're just, you know, fairly inactive. So that's a really key component as far as knowing, okay, here's what half a unit of, you know, Humalog does. Here's what half a unit of Novolog does. Here's what, you know, like I do split dosing with Levomir, you know, because I, I can't, uh, my insulin sensitivity is such that I can't take a 20 unit blast of Levomir and expect to have anything, you know, as far as a good range throughout the day. Um, and I actually use uh, one of the suggestions that I found in Dr. Bernstein's book, between using Novel and R, and then actually I use Humalog and dilute that because, again, I find that even a half a unit of, uh, uh, of Humalog will drop me 40 to 60 points depending on what my activity level is. Wow. You know, if I haven't eaten anything significantly. So the first component there is being comfortable with your insulin and knowing what it will do and how long its action time is and, you know, how long you need before it's, uh, you know, wearing off. And then the second component to that is when you exercise in relation to your last you know, meal and or insulin dose. Um, like, for example, a lot of times I'll uh, weight train, <clears throat> excuse me, in the morning before I have anything to eat. So I'll do, you know, the buzzword now is a fasted workout. Well, I guess you're fasted. I just haven't had, you know, my morning, you know, eggs, avocado and bacon or whatever you want to call it. But I know that everything is stable. You know, I, I wake up generally at, you know, 80 to 100 in some higher instances. But I also know that, you know, I, I'm i not going to spike. And by going and exercising, my, my body's at a nice, like, stable place. And um, I can manage that. Um, you know, another uh, component to that is through using a you know, healthy whole, whole foods, you know, low carbohydrate diet, higher in fat through the last few years. And I'm sure you're the same way. 
you've retrained your body's metabolic uh, efficiency so that it efficiently can use fats as its primary fuel source, which is a very stable you know, form of fuel. That's why your body stores extra energy as fat to, say, to, to use for later. Um, and then you don't, again, have that potential for significant uh, fluctuations and becoming, you know, metabol metabolically flexible and fat adapted, um, you know, allows me to, for example, go out and do a, a three and a half hour mountain bike ride and only use, you know, 20 grams of carbohydrates for the entire ride. And I usually use a product called UCAN Super Starch, which is a stabilized uh, resistance starch that doesn't give me a spike. And that allows me to stay in range throughout the course of that, uh, those types of exercises. That's a, that's pretty good. And so in short, what you're saying is because of the way you work out in the morning, you're doing a fast through a fasted state or fasted if you, since you just haven't eaten yet. And since you're more fat adapted, that really helps keeping your blood sugars more stable throughout exercise. What, what I wanted to, um, really get into though, is your specific regime. Like, do you take any insulin before you work out in the mornings? Do you eat any carbs before you work out? How do you manage that specifically? Yeah, so uh, I can take this morning, for example. Um, you know, I woke up, um, if I recall, I think I woke up, I was at 95 uh, on, the, uh, on the blood glucose meter and uh, basically woke up, had a little bit of coffee, uh, and then you know, ran up to the gym, which is about a mile away from me did a workout with weights. Um, during that time, I, again, I do have the luxury of having a continuous glucose monitor, but I've used that as a tool to know that I'm probably not going to have any issue. But my regime is I will bring um, an insulin pen with me of diluted uh, uh, Humalog so that if I do need to make a correction, I can, you know, if it starts to go into the 130s or 140s from, you know, that, uh, which is a somewhat normal response. Uh, then I can correct. Uh, most mornings I don't need to, though. Um, it basically sits there right at, you know, between 90 and 110, and you know, I have no problem. But I do bring that uh, insulin with me if I do need to correct, and I use the um, insulin pen, this, the pen, excuse me, that take the cartridges because those are really the only ones that allow for half, uh, half unit dosing, because you know, again, that that's where you have to know your body. I'm so insulin sensitive that you know, a whole unit of rapid acting insulin would just would crush me. Like I, you know, I'd have to be in the 200s for me to even think about using a whole unit of undiluted uh, Humalog. But, um, so I'll have an insulin pen with me. And then, you know, uh, with that, you know, always have, you know, some glucose tabs with me in case I do go low. And on that note, you know, some sort of uh, glucose tab or, um, you know, rapid acting carbohydrates really important to have with you so that you can make those micro dosing adjustments. I mean, there's been times where maybe I'm in the course of a workout or something, and I'm, you know, at 85, you know, with uh, drifting down throughout the course of the, uh, the workout, I'll take half a glucose tab or maybe a full one. And then that will bring me back to a, you know, an, a better or an ideal range. So that's the other component is, to avoid over treating with insulin, but also avoid over treating with, um, you know, a form of glucose. So for you, it's a correct as you go kind of thing. And you check yourself constantly with the CGM. That really helps a lot. Uh, you also yeah. sort of implement microdosing to where if you're, if you're shooting a little bit down, you take a little bit of glucose. If you're going a little too high, you take a little bit of insulin and you just sort of correct as you go. Exactly. And then also knowing through routine, you know, whether or not you need to correct, you know, like there's times when I know throughout the course of the workout or the type of exercise that I'm doing, for example, lower heart rate, you know, um, more cardio type activity, I know will decrease my blood sugar, whereas heavy lifting generally will increase it slightly. But knowing that there's going to be some of those fluctuations and just making sure that it doesn't go outside of the values that I've found works for me, you know, or it doesn't uh, go and start trending above 110 to 120 and, you know, or start trending down, you know, below 80. So I have time to correct uh, is also a component. So it's about doing it, finding what works, finding what kinds of insulin impact you specifically 
and being able to predict it from there. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's great. I, I really appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to uh, one of my friends that's been asking me about this. I'm, I'm not very athletic myself, so I love asking people that specific stuff because it's not a topic that I am personally very well versed in. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Now, I want to get into the really interesting part here, the uh, reason you actually messaged me at first. Um, your experience with this as a pilot, correct? Exactly, yep. So let's get into that because you have a very interesting story there, correct? I would think so. <laughs> All right. Well, wonderful. So were you a pilot before becoming type 1 diabetic? Uh, yes, actually, uh, I, I got my initial or kind of first level of pilot's license uh, when I was 16 years old um, and then just kind of built upon that um, all the way through college. Uh, one of my degrees through Ohio State actually uh, was in aviation uh, and then worked as a instructor at Ohio State and then worked my way through uh, as a uh, cargo pilot to build hours uh, so that I had the amount of experience required to put in resumes at an airline and then uh, work my way into being an airline pilot um, uh, after, uh, uh, I don't know, it was probably four years out of school. So uh, out of uh, rather completing all my uh, college education and whatnot. So yeah, it was a uh, kind of a progression from a very young age. And as I said before, I didn't, you know, get diagnosed with type one until five years ago. So, you know, I did have Again, the luxury or, you know, the luck, I suppose, if you want to call it that, of, you know, living quite a while without type 1. So I kind of have had both sides of the fence, so to speak. And when you became type 1, um, you were, were you still able to stay as a pilot? Well, that's uh, one thing. When uh, I went into the hospital and was diagnosed, you know, as pilots, particularly professional airline pilots, you're always mindful of, your health and particular um, conditions that could uh, affect your ability to serve as a pilot. Because as a, uh, a, well, any really level of pilot certificate, there's two components to it. One component is your actual license, which is basically your skills and knowledge to operate an aircraft in the airspace system and in and out of airports and, you know, have the mechanical knowledge to operate the aircraft. And then the other component to it is you have to hold a medical certificate that's issued by the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and of those certificates, the medical certificates, there's three levels of uh, first, second, and third class medical. Um, and to be a professional airline pilot, uh, you generally have to have a first class medical. And in some cases, you can have a second class. And then private pilots or people who are flying around on their with their own uh, aircraft or not for hire can have what's called a third class medical, which I still currently hold, but um, uh, insulin dependent diabetes is a disqualifying event for a uh, first and a second class medical as it sits right now. And myself and many others are working to change that. And we've made some really good inroads on that in the last uh, three to five years. And it's something that's been in the works for quite a while, even before that. But um, you know, as far as the diagnosis of type one, that immediately put an end to my uh, aviation career at that time because I was no longer able to hold that first class medical. I'm sorry to hear that, man. So because you got type one diabetes, instantly you're barred from doing any commercial air flights or anything that would actually make you money, except for your own, per if you had your own personal jet, you'd be able to fly that, but anything else you could no longer do. And that doesn't change despite you having very good control of it? Um, not currently. So one of the uh, aspects that we're working towards as far as from an advocacy standpoint is with the FAA, uh, Federal Aviation Administration, to incorporate some of the various tools and technology that have become available in the last 10 to 15 years and even the last five years that will add an additional level of safety uh, to hopefully allow them to certify or allow its independent diabetic uh, pilots. And some of the um, comparisons or data that we're using is that um, over in the, over in the uh, United Kingdom and uh, Scotland 
uh, Canada and a couple other European uh, countries, they allow it and have allowed insulin-dependent diabetics for the last 10 years. And of those pilots that they uh, are monitoring or tracking, commercial airline pilots that is, they've had no issues of in-flight uh, safety-related concerns due to uh, hypoglycemic events. Um, so that's you know one of the things that we're working towards now is to get the FAA on board with that. And the current status of the federal aviation regulations has a line item in there that actually was changed in 2015 where it says um, that insulin-dependent diabetes is a disqualifying event for what's a normal or a standard first-class medical. However, they can assess each pilot on a case-by-case -case basis, and they allow them to hold what's called a special issuance first-class medical. Um, to date, no one has been approved for that, and that's one of the sticking points or reason why that we're proceeding with this advocacy is to say it's in the regulations, it's in black and white, and yet there's this kind of... Uh, you know, as we say in you know, aviation, a holding pattern where you have these people that have applications in, um, but no one's had any uh, approval from the FAA as of yet. I see. So there actually is a rule in there to where it can be accepted on a case by case basis, but they, and, and I assume people have applied on this case in case basis to get this certification despite having diabetes. But as of yet, there actually have no, not been any approvals from the application process. Correct. Yep. And I myself, you know, you know I'm one of those folks. Mm. And, um, you know, my case uh, or my, I guess, name, along with a few other uh, pilots, 10 of us, um, have actually put our case and or our medical records and stuff behind it. Um, with the American Diabetes Association, who actually um, also put forth an advocacy lawsuit that was filed in July of this year um, to help push this along and to you know up to date, you know the um, the physicians that are uh, at the Federal Aviation Administration in Washington D.C. Uh, are coming around to this and um, you know depending on how optimistic you want to be you know, we may have a break in this, you know, hopefully in the next, you know, three to six months, but it is the government, so you never know that could turn into another year, so. Yeah, you never know of them, unfortunately. Yeah, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see with that, but, you know, on, um, you know, on that advocacy standpoint, you know, that's obviously has a direct impact on myself and other uh, pilots, but it's just, you know, another thing where, you know, if someone has taken the time to educate themselves about the disease, uh, is willing to put in the time and the work and can safely maintain their ranges and know how to you know, manage their blood sugars appropriately, there shouldn't be any reason that you, you know, can't operate an aircraft uh, safely. And, you know, my standpoint on that, you know, someone might say, well, what's your, how, what are you basing that off of? Like, what are your, uh, sort of qualifications to make that judgment. And I said, well, uh, over 14,000 hours of flight time and uh, a 25 year career in the aviation industry, uh, and of which I've been an instructor and am currently serving as an instructor with my current airline, because that doesn't require uh, a medical certificate to teach our ground and systems class on the aircraft, along with our flight simulators and the full motion flight simulators. And I routinely assess pilot qualifications on a daily basis and know from my own experience um, what the rigors are of being an airline pilot and can attest to the fact that as long as you're controlling type 1 or even insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes appropriately, you know, it can be done safely. I agree 100% with that. It can be done safely. And, I mean... We're, we're proving it all the time by having such good blood sugars and actually being able to maintain it so well. Um, one thing I'm curious about, though, is along with your advocacy, I'm glad to see the ADA and all these people are coming together to pressure the FAA to make these changes. But I assume they'll want some sort of standard, right? Like what kind of qual like what kind of standard would they look for as far as, okay, this guy has good control, this guy doesn't have good control. Would it be assessing their time and range? Would it be looking at their A1C? What do you think about that? 
That's a good point. Good question. Um, and on that, uh, basically in 2013, the FAA uh, had convened a, uh, a group of endocrinologists, physicians, treating physicians, and uh, some other folks that were directly involved with in, uh, diabetes management and had knowledge about uh, blood glucose and you know, insulin excursions and so on, um, to basically say, first of all, can this be done safely? And if so, what would your recommendations be to ensure that it's uh, the, the applicants or the pilots are maintaining safe levels well in the flight deck? So that, that's what they are tasked with. And of that, they came out with a about a 10 page document of their recommendations as far as what they would look for as a protocol to do just what you said, which is certify this person is showing uh, knowledge and, and adequate control. And this other person perhaps has some work to do. You know, it wouldn't prohibit them, but they would say, look, you need to fall within these criteria to get a special issuance medical. Um, and basically what happened with those recommendations were, um, they were utilized to uh, issue special issuance third class medicals. And of those, uh, there's some components there where basically they require you to do a finger stick uh, blood glucose uh, measurement, you know, within an hour of your uh, proposed uh, flight time. You have to do one every hour in flight. And then um, within an hour after the flight is complete, you have to have um, uh, in flight, they want you to maintain a blood glucose range, which, you know, you as well as I, I think this is a little high, but between 100 and 300. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, and, and the nature behind that is that, um, you know, of course, when you're talking about potential incapacitation or mental impairment, of course, the standard, uh, viewpoint on that is high, you know, high blood glucose is quote unquote, better than low blood glucose, right? So that's why they have that range. But that range would only be required during flight. It wouldn't be something that they're going to, that they require all the time, because I, I mean, that'd be kind of preposterous, but um, it would only be during flight. Uh, and then if you go outside of that range or drop below 100, you have to correct with, uh, you know, a glucose tab or an appropriate amount of um, carbohydrate and then retest, and then if it doesn't come back into that range, then you need to, you know, find a place to land and, you know, uh, correct on the ground. And there, there's many parameters that they have in, in place, along with um, a, uh, a form or a letter uh, by your treating endocrinologist that certifies that you're, you know, well controlled and that are knowledgeable on how to both test and treat your own blood glucose uh, values. And then another component that was a big push um, was the uh, requirement to uh, utilize and turn in uh, CGM data. Um, and that's another thing that, you know, myself, along with others uh, in the ADA, um, put forth to the FAA to say, with the, these newer, more accurate CGMs, with trend values, you know, you would almost have to or you would almost have to deliberately not take corrective action for you to have a hypoglycemic event in the flight deck, you know? Um, and so there, there's those components that actually would uh, stipulate or would uh, kind of provide clarification to say this person's within these parameters and can meet them, and therefore they should be issued a special issues medical and versus someone who, you know, is not, you know? Um, and there's some other parameters in there as far as medications, how long you have to be on a medication before you can uh, you know, use it, or an insulin type before you can use it during flight and so on. Um, so, you know, there, there are parameters out there that are, have already been established to, you know, make that determination. It's not just, you know, willy-nilly, well, that guy over there seems like a good person and that lady over there, now I don't like her, so she's not getting one, you know? So you do have to have very defined uh, criteria so that it's fair for everyone that's willing to put forth the work. Man, it, it will not be easy for these type ones to keep their licensing uh, in some respects. 
as I'm glad there is a standard. I'm not so glad that the standard is what it is, being that having to cruise above 100 for the whole flight is not necessarily healthy. Um, mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. I hope they can work on that, maybe bring it down to 90 or at least 90 or 80, so that way sure. people like me or you who are good at keeping it with and those levels can still fly and maintain our licensing just fine. Um, glad to see that there's a standard, though. I'm glad to see that they're working on that. And I'm glad to see that it's so close, too. Three to six months, optimistically, would be an amazing step forward for anyone that's trying to get in the aviation business with Type 1. And hopefully anyone watching this who would like to be a pilot someday or who is um, currently working on that career is not going to be discouraged from doing that because hopefully by then they'll be able to apply and actually manage that very well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, to to speak to that, you know, folks that are out there that might see this or that have, you know, even parents that have, you know, kids that are interested, you know, you can go out right now and, you know, fly and get your private pilot's license and actually even be a certified flight instructor um, with type 1 or insulin-dependent diabetes and have a uh, third-class medical. Um, so it's something that you can even start pursuing now. Um with the uh, caveat that to date, um, you know, it's not, um, you know, we haven't gotten anyone approved for uh, commercial aviation, but there's lots of people out there working on that. And, you know, we're, we're doing our best to move that along. Let's keep our fingers crossed. And hopefully they're lower, they'll have a little bit of a lower limit for those of us that can keep it between 80 and 100 successfully. Hopefully we'll, we'll yeah. see. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's one of those things, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start there and then as the data comes in and, and hopefully as, you know, we start having uh, more positive examples, you know, we can start moving that, you know, moving that lower limit down there, you know, a bit more, you know, but that's all down the road and we got to have some, and, that, and that's really all the pilots that are advocating for this. Um, are asking for is like, we just want, you know, you give us a standard and we will meet it. We just need to know what that standard is and that if we meet it, that we can then get approved. And that's, that's all we're asking for. <laughs> One concern I have is, I mean, have they ever met a diabetic who's running at 300? I mean, we can get, I, I don't know about you, yeah. but I can get pretty cranky when my blood sugar is above 200. So sure. I, I don't yeah. know. I feel like I feel like having them up at three hundred is, is pretty. You're testing the yeah, fire you know, there, you and, know. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think well, it's you know some of the things that you've uh, addressed on various other videos and you know other uh, folks in the you know type one and even uh, you know health space have have addressed where unfortunately you know there are a lot of folks that are not. Um, I guess operating or keeping their blood glucose in a in a healthy range uh, or a normal range, and unfortunately, the body is has a great capacity to uh, adjust and reach a new equilibrium. And so, you know, some of those folks that are used to running at 200, you know, that's normal for them. And if they drop their blood glucose too rapidly to 100, they have hypoglycemic symptoms. You know. I mean, you know that as much as yeah, I. Yeah, unfortunately. So, which is which is unfortunate, but I mean, you know, there's certain people that you know see, you know, your your uh, you know time and range values between you know 75 or 70 and 120, and they're like they freak out because they're like, well, man, if I go with you know below you know 90, I start sweating and you know think I'm hypo, and it's just like, well, that's because your body has and your brain specifically has become, you know accustomed and is doing its best to find some way to deal with those higher blood glucose values, you know, but yeah, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I'm sure my wife wouldn't want to have anything to do with me if I was, you know, two to 300. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. I get noticeably more cranky when I'm that high and I'm sure, I'm sure it's the case for the, the unfortunate thing about these standards is that, I mean, this even applies to the ADAs guidelines for what's a good blood sugar you're not you're not focusing on the fringe which unfortunately is the guys that actually have under control they're focusing on the mean the average and the average unfortunately does not have their diabetes in control 
And so they have to keep these standards with those kind of people in mind, rather than those that really have tamed their type 1. Hopefully one day the average becomes those that have tamed their type 1 rather than those that haven't, but we are not there today, unfortunately. Exactly, yeah, you know, there, there is that need where, um, you know, you have kind of that, that outlier, so to speak, you know, and I mean, one could easily, uh, you know, and I, I would kind of self-admit, you know, like doing what we do from a nu nutritional aspect, we are outliers, mm -hmm. you know, from not only the type 1 or the diabetic community, but, you know, just, you know, standard American diet, you know, we are extreme outliers per se. And, you know, that's just where you have to be kind of comfortable in that space, but that doesn't make it, you know, wrong. And I think I could make a pretty good argument that, you know, what we're doing is, um, you know, a, 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 at least an easier, if not a better way to do it. And, and it's not to say that people who don't adhere to the dietary management that we do are bad people. It's just that in some cases, I think, man, you know, if only they knew or they only they could see or have a taste of a week in the life of someone who's you know consuming between 20 and 60 grams of carbohydrates a day and see how much easier that is from a management standpoint and what the health uh, uh, advantages are on top of that. If only. And it, it, it really is a world difference. And unfortunately, you can't really ex see it until you experience it. Uh, for those, if, if any of you are watching that haven't tried a low carb approach yet, give it a go. It really makes a world of difference. Unfortunately, one thing I do notice, and this is a big problem that doctors have with low carb, is that people will try low carb without knowing how to do low carb, and so sure. they won't do well. Like I have a friend, for example, who said, "Oh, he tried keto. His A1C actually went up." And I asked him, well, were you bolusing for protein? Were you doing this? Were you doing that? And he said, no, I've never heard about doing any of that. I just cut back on my carbs. So there yeah. is, there, unfortunately, there is a learning curve that people don't understand if they don't know what they're doing. And if they don't understand how to do it right and they've never experienced it, then they'll just wave it off hand. And I can't blame them, unfortunately. And that's why it's important for us to be advocates about it. That's why it's important for us to get the knowledge out there about how to do it. And how to do it right until then we have to deal with going with the standards that the average unhealthy diabetic has rather than the fringe healthy diabetic has we'll see though hopefully as time goes on that will change um one thing you mentioned was your nutrition i, I want to segue to that because one thing i love asking people and i love i'm sure people love seeing is what you're eating on this approach so Yep. Uh, take us through a day of what kind of nutrition, what what kind of food you're eating to stay low carb and stay under 20 grams a day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the, I guess to begin that, you know, with is that uh, I do like to tell people that, you know, if this, uh, you know, aviation track and our, um, uh, if we are able to accomplish our goal as far as getting back into the flight deck, I think that low carbohydrate diet and you know staying away from the processed you know heavily refined foods is absolutely crucial to that uh goal but you know from, from my you know, standpoint um nutritionally on a on a various days um you know because of my activity level i might modify you know the total number of carbohydrates that i have slightly and i think that's a component to low carb sometimes it isn't talked about sometimes people have a hard set number to say, well, you know, you, you, you have to stay below 40 grams of carbohydrates or you're not part of the cool kids club anymore. <laughs> you can't call yourself, you know, low carb or something. And the whole idea is, is that, you know, you need to supply your, your body with what it needs, um, and it, based upon activity level and, you know, where you're at for that day. So that's not to say, okay, it's a, you know, it's a free for all every time you go out and exercise. No, it's to say, you know, some days if I'm going in and doing a double shift at work, and I'm doing a 14 or 16 hour day, you know, in the flight sims and or, and or teaching class, and I'm not very active, you know, I might stay between 20 and 30 grams of carbohydrates for the day. Other days when I'm going out and doing a three and a half hour mountain bike ride with 4,000 feet of climbing, 
I might use 80 grams of carbohydrates that day. So you can be aware of, and that's kind of uh, a little, some might call it minutia, but it's an important aspect because if you try and use the exact same approach for every single day, you're probably not going to get the results that you want. So that's one component I like to talk, talk, you know, express to people when I'm talking to them about this. But like for me, you know, I usually start off with uh, some known, some known foods, you know, you don't want to get too creative on a daily basis because then it destabilizes what you're trying to do. Right. You won't be so consistent. You want to minimize variables. You know, it's, um, you know, what, what I call them or what we call in the aviation industry, uh, risk mitigation. Right. So, you know, I'm not going to get too creative and, see what happens. But um, I usually will have some sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, like for a, a breakfast or a morning meal, so to speak, you know, I'll have some sort of, you know, eggs mixed with maybe some, uh, you know, breakfast sausages of some sort, um, you know, maybe some, uh, you know, some seasonings in there, you know, some sort of uh, maybe a few mushrooms or something like that, kind of make an omelet of some sort, uh, and then maybe have avocado. Uh, I do enjoy avocados with a little bit of hot sauce or something and some salt. Um, you know, every once in a while I might, you know, make some, um, you know, maybe a, a low carb pancake or something with like a little bit of uh, flaxseed and almond flour, you know, or you can even use pork rinds, you know, for, uh, to make some of those, maybe mix that in there if I'm going to have a more active day. Um, and then, you know, I, I do drink some coffee here and there. Um, you know, mid, midday stuff, you know, some sort of protein, you know, some sort of meat, um, combined with, um, you know, maybe some vegetables of some sort, you know, some olives, some pickles, you know, something of that nature, uh, again, relatively low carbohydrate. Um, and then for dinner, you know, just real, real whole foods, you know, some, some vegetables, you know, like spaghetti squash and cauliflower and, you know, broccoli and, you know, even some of the you know, spinach, lettuce, that type of stuff, the vegetables. Um, you know, I generally stay away from like root vegetables, things like carrots and things like that, because they do tend to be higher in carbohydrate and sugar, um, naturally occurring sugar, but sugar nonetheless. Um, you yeah, know, definitely stay away from, you know, the potatoes. And um, there's one guy that uh, I uh, podcast I started listening to a while back who has a really good phrase and it's called no sugars and no grains. Well, look at the foods and say, well, is it a sugar or is it a grain? And people say, well, what's the deal with grains? Well, without going too far down the rabbit hole, you know, grains have other negative consequence to people's health besides just blood glucose. I mean, you know, a lot of times they're inflammatory to cause, you know, gut issues. And, you know, some people don't even know that they react to them. Uh, and, oh yeah, they are a carbohydrate. So you want to be mindful of that. And then sugars, well then look at something and say, well, that doesn't mean it's a, uh, you know, Snickers bar. It means does it have some form of sugar in it? That could be natural. It could be added. It could be, you know, outright table sugar. It could be, you know, various things. And if it has one of those two things in them, you know, if not completely refrain from eating it, you know, eat it in extreme moderation, you know. Um, but, yeah, you know, for dinners, you know, I mean, we grill out, you know, you make hamburgers, you make steaks, you make, you know, chicken you know we use the crock pot a lot you know like if there's people who are out there working or they have a big family to feed i mean you know give yourself a crock pot i mean you put a, a roast in there or a couple of pork shoulders and make pulled pork and you're good for three or four days you know so there's all different kinds of uh, ways to do it um but yeah i mean that's usually an average day for me and i might add in some things here and there depending on what i'm doing throughout the day sounds amazing that's the way to do it man you know um, keep it consistent, but you can still keep it delicious. Have some meat, have some veggies. Just don't go too nuts with it, right? Don't go too nuts and don't God avoid the sugars and the grains. One thing I'm curious about, though, you said you eat, you try to eat more carbs in the days where you're very active. Um, right. where, when you're more active, where do you get those carbs from? Um, I always try to make sure that they're coming from a minimally processed uh, source. You know, that could be, as I mentioned, uh, particularly when we're out biking, uh, mountain biking and so on, I'll use a product called um, UCAN Super Starch, which it's a, it's a form of corn starch, but they heat it and there's a process. It was actually developed for um, uh, children that aren't able to um, metabolize fats appropriately. It's a very, you know, rare metabolic disease. But um, anyway, 
they parlayed that into a kind of sports uh, drink, and they do make some bars and stuff. But the bars have a lot of weird, you know, sugar alcohols in them and stuff. So I stay away from those. But um, I'll use that on the bike, and you know, with that, you know, I'll do like one scoop of that, and I'll be like 20 grams of carbohydrates, uh, which might sound like a lot, but if you're out for multiple hours and you're you're it's 20 grams of carbohydrates and you know what 80 gram or rather uh, 80 calories total you know that's a drop in the bucket when you're out you know going through 1400 calories in the course of your workout you know um so that that type of thing um some other things that i'll use uh, if i do need to bring my glucose up um those little applesauce packets you know that you can get at like costco or sam's or whatever those ones that are exact i think there are 12 grams of carbohydrates you know in one shot if i need if I need that to correct uh, or to arrest a, a low that might be coming, I'll use those because um, that's obviously a much more rapidly absorbed carbohydrate. Um, let's see what else. Um, you know, sometimes if I know that it's going to be a multiple days in a row uh, of exercise, your um, uh, you know your carbohydrate tolerance will change a little bit. In some cases, we might have a half of a, you know, I'm sure some people are going to freak out, but like a butternut squash. But again, that's only 17 grams of carbohydrates. I mean, if you just went out and, you know, went hiking for six hours, you, you're, you're not going to get a big spike from that. Plus there's fiber in there and it's a naturally occurring carbohydrate. So it's not going to give you these massive excursions like processed foods do. So, you know, those are some examples there of just, uh, you know, natural whole foods that you can utilize to, uh, to, you know, kind of do what you need to do there. I see. And you're doing it more to avoid going low when you're doing these endurance activities and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's smart. I think it's pretty smart. Um, I've always, I've always been an advocate for a more meat based approach, but that doesn't mean you can't have carbs when you need carbs. Obviously. I, I always yeah. I want to make sure people understand that. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it's, we're, getting, we're getting close to the hour mark here, so I want to bring this to a close and just ask you one last thing here. So I think we've summed it all up pretty well. We've done a pretty good job of hitting all the points. Um, what would you say was the biggest change um, between how you were before, how you were eating before, how your blood sugar control was before low carb, and how it is now? Yeah, I would definitely say that the nutritional component was the single biggest variable. You know, the technology didn't do it. The different types of insulin didn't do it. The doctor certainly didn't do it. Uh, and no one outside of, you know, um, you know, the person at hand can really change that. So, you know, your biggest variable that can really um, affect most positively is um, educating yourself uh, on you know, the various types of foods, what's in the food, reading uh, ingredient labels, uh, and, you know, getting those, getting that carbohydrate count down, um, and, um, you know, finding foods that you enjoy, because again, we all know, if it's not sustainable, what's the point, you know, so you just need to find those low carbohydrate, healthy whole foods, whether that's, you know, carnivore, whether that's, you know, uh, you know, mixing in some cruciferous vegetables like we do um but we still eat a ton of meat don't get me wrong there but we eat lots of meat but um you know we're even going into uh you know vegetarian you know you can still do low, low carbohydrate vegetarian there's a great book called uh, ketotarian that uh, dr will cole put out that does you know low carb keto vegetarian uh protocol uh I'm not a big fan of the, the, the vegan track because I personally feel as though it's very, very difficult uh, to avoid nutritional de deficiencies with that diet unless you're putting a lot of time and effort into it and uh, are very well versed on uh, supplementation. But that's another you know topic altogether. <laughs> Understood. So it wasn't... I like to get this point across. This is really important. It wasn't the technology which everyone's focusing on days. It wasn't just that, but it was actually learning what food works for you and what doesn't. Going low carb um, and actually educating yourself on how to best manage it was what really made the difference and not just the technology. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, 
you know, just one final note there is sometimes, you know, again, we, we all know that, you know, diabetes and, you know, uh, you know, type one or type two, you know, it doesn't discriminate, you know, it's, it's all across the board. And, you know, sometimes people have a misconception that eating healthy whole foods has to be expensive. And that's just not true. I mean, you, you can do it across the board. I mean, you know, you can go and, you know, do you have to, is it great if you can get, you know, the really high quality meats and, you know, you know, ethically raised and, you know, slaughtered and all, and, and all those components. Yeah, that's ideal, but it's not required. I mean, you can go and, you know, go to Walmart, go to Sam's, go to Costco and get, you know, ground meat and, and, and whatever, you know, you can afford. And any departure from the standard, standard American diet and processed foods and hitting Taco Bell and that kind of stuff is 200% better than you did, you know, just the day before. And as a closing note, you know, I mean, sometimes people think it's overwhelming and I'm, you know, just the, the greatest journey starts with the first step. You know, you just take one step, you can do it today. You can do it your next meal. If you're eating, you know, watching this while you're eating, maybe take one less bite of those, you know, potatoes and start there. You know, I mean, it's, it can, it doesn't have to be overwhelming all at once. That is exactly right. I love that. It's, uh, any any great journey starts with the first step. Well, keep that in mind as you tame your type one. Start now. Don't you know? Don't just start tomorrow. Don't just start this evening. Start it now. Take that first step, and you'll be on your way to better blood sugars and finally taming that type one. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us today. This is how John tamed his type one. <laughs>